We run a clinic in Melbourne uh, specifically uh, for Fragile X Syndrome, people with Fragile X Syndrome. We see people across all the age groups. But we, as most of you will know, we've got quite a few adults um, from community residential units and homes um, around this area. So Coinda um, and uh, Cobden, Warrnambool uh, here. If I've left anywhere out, I'm, I'm sorry. And, um, and quite often people come in and they'll say, we're having these problems. This is what's happening with our guy or our girl. Uh, what do we do? And um, we can only do so much in a, in a limited, you know, half hour, one hour consultation in Melbourne. And uh, for a long time I've been saying, hey, let's, uh, let's do a workshop up here with everybody. So that, that's the aim of today is, is really for you and try and give you a bit of a handle on the people that you're working with. Just to give us an idea, who's, who's currently looking after someone with Fragile X Syndrome? Just give me a bit of a handle. Okay. And um, who's looking after an adult with Fragile X Syndrome? Right. Anyone have a, a, a younger person, so under 18? Okay. Terrific. Um, we're going to concentrate on adults, but you're going to hear from a lot about kids uh, today as well because it's the same person and it's the same issues. Um, so that's me and just so you know how I got into it is um, I'm just a, a humble family GP in a suburb called North Caulfield in Melbourne's uh, southeast and um, we have a, a, a one of our kids here today, Michael, who we'll be hearing from later on, um, grew up a very uh, upset and anxious young child and um, eventually, around the age of seven, got diagnosed with Fragile X Syndrome, which threw Rochelle and myself into this new world of genetics and behaviour. And um, we opened up at the clinic in around 96, 97 um, and talked some amazing clinicians into coming to work with us and uh, You'll be hearing from some of them later on today, through the day. And uh, we, we learned an awful lot. We've now seen well over 300 people with Fragile X Syndrome. We wanted to share some of what, what, what we've learned uh, with you today. So I didn't get this on your notes. So if you haven't got our address and uh, contact numbers, could you please just scribble that down on the notes in case you ever want to get in touch with us if you haven't got that information already. The main thing is phone number, I guess, and website. And uh, you've got some information about the National Association, which Liz just spoke to you about. So what's the big deal about Fragile X? Aside from the fact that we're all involved with it, where, where does it sit on the world stage? It is the most common known inherited cause of developmental disability. So it's the next most common after Down syndrome, but it's the most common inherited cause, and that's from a gene that gets inherited. It's quite common. It, it's about as common as cystic fibrosis in genetic terms. So it's about one in three and a half thousand people in Australia and around the world will have Fragile X Syndrome and will be affected by Fragile X Syndrome. Amazingly, one in 200 women, it's actually more than 250, it's one in 200 women carry the premutation, all of whom are at risk of having a child with Fragile X Syndrome. So this makes it one of the most common common causes of, of um, inherited genetic problems in the world. And people say, well, why don't I know about it? This is fairly new. So genetic technology has really only come about in the last two, three decades. And it's still not been introduced as a routine. The reason to look for a diagnosis, if you think, hey, this person might have Fragile X Syndrome, is to zoom in on implementing effective treatment and management strategies. It, it's not enough, and I think you've all worked this out, and hopefully why you're here today, behavioural management alone doesn't mean anything unless you know what it is that you're dealing with. And, and Astra and everyone is gonna, are going to talk to you in detail about that today. But the other reason to get a diagnosis is so that family members who are at risk of carrying the gene can be detected as being a carrier before they start having children and can make decisions that are appropriate for them and for their family. It's an important condition because this is one of the first genetic conditions that has actually opened up the neurobiological basis into understanding anxiety, autism, um, behaviour in general. 
People of all ages are affected. All races, ethnic groups, and both genders. You often see in a lot of the literature that males are more affected. Um, I think by the end of the today, hopefully you'll, if you don't know that already, you'll see it's not exactly right. And this is an important point, and I apologise for those of you who have seen this before. It's one of my favourite slides. I haven't learned anything about Fragile X Syndrome yet, so it's probably not fair, but look at these three girls and their three sisters. And put your hand up if you think the one on your left might be affected by Fragile X Syndrome. Now, how would I know you're saying? Well, put your hand up if you think they might be affected. Okay. What about the one in the middle, little baby? Any ideas? Could they have fragile, could she have fragile X syndrome? I'm not being fair, am I? What about the one on the right? She looks a little bit different. Might she have fragile X syndrome? Maybe. I know you're all scared to put your hand up, and that's fine. <laughs> They've all got fragile X syndrome. They all have the full mutation of fragile X syndrome. They're sisters, they inherited it from their, they got the gene from their mum. And they've all done really well, by the way. But you cannot tell by looking at them. We cannot tell. You can only diagnose with a blood test. Important point. So when you see someone who you think, hey, they might have something, they need to get a blood test. We'll talk a bit about that later on. I want to emphasise this about Fragile X Syndrome. It's not just behavioural. It's not just the way someone behaves. There's a, a neurodevelopmental basis. It's the way they're built. And it's important to understand that when we're implementing um, various treatments and management strategies. This is Genetics 101. So here we've got a chromosome. These are the, the template building blocks of the body. The X chromosome, you can see that arrow down on the bottom right. The long arm of the X chromosome is extended. It's a bit longer. And under the microscope, which is how they used to do the old genetics, it looks fragile, it looks like it's going to break. And that's why in 1949, this was described as the Fragile X Syndrome. It's the, the appearance of it. What has been discovered since is that the, that chromosome is actually a double helix of molecules, DNA molecules, which looks like that. And it's four molecules that alternate. This Cytosine, guanine, guanine, CGG repeat in most people repeats 30 times. But the mutation or change in the gene in Fragile X is an expansion to much greater than that. And it can be 50, 200, 1,000, 3, 4, 5,000 repeats long. And when that piece of DNA expands out, the function alters, it switches off and stops producing a protein which is vital for normal neurological development. It's called the FMRP protein. So the change in Fragile X, and we don't know why it happens, is that expansion in the gene switches off, no protein or little protein, and not enough to result in a, a standard or usual neurological development. Development still occurs, it's just a bit different. So that expansion, if it's more than 55 repeats, so from 56 to around 200 repeats. It's called the premutation. These are the carriers, can be male or female, and generally they're not affected, certainly not intellectually for most cases. It's only once the gene expands more than 200 repeats, they put 230 here, but it's generally more than 200 repeats that the gene switches off. That's the full mutation, and that's what we're going to be concentrating on today. So putting this up as a block diagram because you may read stuff on the internet and you may hear about this, but they've discovered with a premutation that in fact there are a few things that happen with a premutation that mainly occur, not so much in children, but later on. So there's FAXTAS, which is a fragile X tremor ataxia syndrome where older people develop a Parkinsonian-like tremor and altered gait and can develop a dementia. So that's only with the premutation, not with the full mutation. People can get ovarian insufficiency. So females who are the female carriers um, can get early menopause and have difficulty with fertility before that. And then there's a whole range of um, fragile X associated neuropsychiatric disorders. Um, 
which I won't go into now, they can cross over to the full mutation, but we're only talking about the full mutation today. So that's on the right, which causes developmental, emotional and behavioural problems, and a range of physical issues. So when we talk about phenotype, it means how does a full mutation present? Well, primarily developmental. So it's the main presentation if you ask any medical person, what is fragile S? They say, oh, it's intellectual disability. So, so global developmental delay, L late reaching, reaching milestones, uh, late speaking, walking, understanding, uh, difficulty learning. Um, they're, they're the standard things that are in all of the books and all the literature. Developmental delay, intellectual disability, learning problems. What we see and what comes in to our clinic and what everyone here will struggle with are the emotional and behavioural problems, which we're going to talk about in detail um, through the day. There's a few physical issues which, again, the older books talked about, so before DNA testing came out, all we had was physical features and they're often not present. I showed you those three girls before because they're all absolutely normal looking people, but you do see some people with um, very narrow face, ears sticking out, um, high forehead, and um, there are a whole lot of other things which are not uh, dramatic, you know, disastrous things that generally don't cause any, any problems through life. Again, it's the emotional and behavioural issues and that's what we're going to um, concentrate on today. A special word on females because um, in the books it all seems to concentrate on males. I, I think males appear more affected because when they get anxious they tend to externalise their behaviour. They'll kick out, they'll get aggressive. Females more often than not will internalise, they'll just go quiet. So girls often with a full mutation will go through school and they'll sit in the classroom very quietly and won't cause any problems. They may be struggling inside, they often are, but they're not a problem to the teacher, so there's no complaints. They'll often get picked up late or often not picked up. Um, they typically will struggle with things like maths, um, uh, spatial organisation, but especially executive function. Executive function is the ability to organise your day. Um, plan what you're going to be doing, get to appointments on time, um, balance your books, pay your bills. Um, and a lot of the, most of the girls have absolutely normal intellect or sometimes some learning issues. It's the executive function and some of the anxiety issues which um, we'll hear about later on in the day. So we see all of these things in the females and you know, you'll say, well, how do I pick that up? I know lots of girls who are very shy and very quiet and get a bit anxious. It, it's very common, and it is common. But this is one genetic cause of that, and it's quite pronounced. So this um, young lady, um, the same, I want to emphasise this point when they say girls are less affected. So she was um, intellectually quite disabled. She didn't get through school. Um, she, her mother was also affected and was unable to look after her, so her grandparents brought her up and uh, she was unable to speak. She, she was pretty much a verbal. She could point and she's sitting here with speech therapist Felicia Schmarman <laughs> and she was able to point at things so she could understand what was being asked of her and respond appropriately with her fingers but she couldn't say anything and that's an important point which um, our speechy Bev um, sure will speak about lately. So understanding perhaps more than able to express. This is what I give families who come in uh, for the first time. Uh, it's a bit of a checklist to go through and to make sure that all of this has been done. Um, and it's all in your notes, I won't spend a lot of time on it. But it's, it, everyone needs to go through this one by one and say, OK, has this been done? Um, has this person had their hearing checked, their vision checked, had a full preventive check just like anyone else for have the immunisation status up to date, um, seen a dentist. And although this is orientated more at children, it's still relevant for adults, perhaps more relevant for adults because they haven't had often the same amount of input or same attention that, that uh, young kids seem to get. 
So this guy, uh, when we first met him, was um, in his late 40s, about 50. Um, and here's the full mutation, Fragile X. You can see he's got fairly high forehead. Um, that's, again, normal. You know, you wouldn't look at him and say, oh, it's Fragile X. But he'd had a very unfortunate time because as he was growing up, he was very anxious and he couldn't express himself properly. And when he did speak, a lot of, you know, words, mixed up words would come out. He, he couldn't put a cohesive sentence together. So he was misdiagnosed by the people that saw him with schizophrenia. And he was actually, for five years, uh, an inmate in one of the psychiatric hospitals in Melbourne. It sounds worse than, than I'm putting it. It's actually quite a nice place, big gardens and nice people, and he was well looked after. Um, eventually, someone um, decided, hey, he actually isn't mentally ill. He doesn't need to live here. And he was moved into one of the larger community um, units for people with intellectual disability in Melbourne called Kew Cottages. Again, a lovely place, very nice. Uh, except that uh, the, one of the premiers in Victoria at the time decided these places were no good. Um, we're going to put everyone in homes with five people. So he was moved into a home with five people, which was lock up and he couldn't get out. And he became quite distressed. So he was taken to um, a professor of developmental disability medicine at Monash, Bob Davis, who said, oh, we might get a test done and was diagnosed with Fragile X syndrome. So he'd never been fully worked up. One of the things that we found along the way is that um, he was deaf as well. And you can see that line, the 20 decibel line. So anything above is normal and below not so good. Anything below 40 is you need a hearing aid. So not only was he intellectually disabled, but he was also deaf. No one had ever, ever done a hearing test for him. No one had thought to do that. And his mum's bright lady. She's a, actually, she's a nurse. Um, but it had never been recommended. I want to emphasise hearing, vision, general preventive care for everybody, and I think that's done better nowadays. This uh, guy, is, uh, he and his brother, live together uh, in, their ha in a house by themselves with minimal supervision. Uh, his brother works as a night cleaner, uh, has a licence. Um, he was working at McDonald's for 13 years. And McDonald's was uh, it's a terrific training program, and um, he started off being shown what to do, and gradually progressed and uh, uh, it was an ideal job for him. But one day his um, parents came in with him and said, look, he's started to sweat a lot and the manager's complaining about him sweating. Um, can you fix it? And, you know, the most common cause of sweating is heat followed by anxiety. Uh, why do you think he started sweating all of a sudden after 13 years working in the same job? Any ideas? Something changed. Something changed. Good. What changed? <coughs> Routine. No, same job, same thing. Exactly the same thing. I'll give you a hint. The manager said he's sweating. He can't come to work if he's sweating so much. What's the problem? The manager. Okay. And, and this is the big problem that I think we all face. And I don't think we're going to resolve these today too much. But... A lot of these guys and girls are put into situations where the environment is not appropriate for them. This manager just didn't like him, didn't want him there, couldn't accept him for being a little bit different, even though he had been doing a really good job and was pressuring him, and he was not able to cope with that. Uh, change of manager or change of job. So he stopped working. These four guys are brothers. They live out in Shepparton, and uh, we've seen them a couple of times, a few times. Um, they live together in their own group home. It works really, really well. It's one of the few situations where group home does work well for people with Fragile X Syndrome. And they've grown up together as brothers. So they, they all know what each other's about. They accept each other. Um, they keep the place spick and span. They clean the house. They do the garden. Um, they have, someone stays over overnight. One of them works part time in town. Um, and they're well known. It, it works really, really well.